distorting perception to such an extent that one sees hallucinations, falsities, things that aren't there, inaccurate perceptions. I see these substances rather as de-hallucinogens, uh, and I think that's a, a pretty typical traditional conception of them. In uh, de-hallucinogens. De-hallucinogens. In other words, uh, to put it in the terms of that the Hindus use, the the world is Maya or illusion. Uh, our pers our quotidian or everyday perception of the world as solid and material as permanent that is definitely an hallucination. Uh, if you look at the some of the far out theories of modern physics and so forth, uh, it's not really the way the world is supposed to be. And when if we look at it scientifically, we conceive of the universe or uh, the physical universe as consisting of space and energy. And uh, this, the appearance of solidity or uh, solid objects is, is strictly an artifact of the coarseness of our level of perception. If we had a much finer level of perception, we wouldn't be able to perceive solidity. And so I feel when when I take entheogens, I I get into this more or less non-materialistic state where I perceive the universe more as energy, or you could say as spirit, less as matter. And uh, in the right circumstances, it's not perceived as matter at all, but just as energy and dynamic flux. That's what science tells us is there. And uh, obviously, for survival purposes, we need to perceive the world as solid and and material. Now. Our, our brain, we tend to think of our sensory organs as windows onto the world, but uh, it's also possible to conceive of them as filters, filtering out uh, what Blake called ch narrow chinks in the cavern, filtering out a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum of the energy that we're surrounded by and indeed bathed in. So our senses can be seen as filters that filter out a very small segment of that which can be processed by our nervous system, which, as impressive as it is, is relatively puny compared to this uh, amazing uh, display of energy that the universe represents. And so, in, in some way, the entheogens either change the frequency setting, they, they, they expand the bandwidth, they, they enable us to perceive, in my opinion, to have a more accurate perception of the universe, a more accurate perception of something energy and dynamic flux. Now, the appearance of solidity is an artifact of, I, I believe, neuro, neurologically something like 70% of the input into our brains is optical through the optic nerve, and, and uh, we know our linguistic system and so forth is very much tied to visual perception, uh, so much so that with our optical, with our eyes, what we see are reflections off of surfaces. So we're getting a very superficial view on the world. Uh, we're just seeing reflections off of surfaces. And uh, I think that the entheogens tend to de-emphasize that. And uh, I don't pretend to understand it on a neurological level or a neurochemical level, and anyone who says they do is probably lying because we really don't have enough information to, to, uh, to come up with a coherent theory for this. But in as simple terms as I can come up with, I would say that it makes you enables you to see the the universe more as energy, less as matter. And in that sense, it's a type of a de hallucinogen because that's the way the universe is. How does hemp fit into the um, family of entheogens? Well, again, uh, entheogen is a concept that refers to the context of use rather than uh, any particular type of pharmacology or chemistry, but uh, certainly hemp has been and is still used as an entheogen. It has a very prominent role in, in India, religious role in India and in Nepal and in uh, especially the Shivainite brands, branches of, uh, of Hinduism. It's also used as an entheogen in the, the Coptic Zion Church, the Rastafari religion. It is also used uh, in the Santo Daime religion in in South America, although because of legal problems, that's become more or less something that people don't talk about, uh, but it certainly has a role there. Um, it, again, it's entheogen is a concept relating to the context of use rather than the pharmacology. I think most people that have familiarity with these substances tend to class cannabis along with this, the, the shamanic inebriants. Uh, on the other hand, personally, from my own um, 
standpoint, my own use, and again, anything I say about this is just based on my own experience and it's my own opinion, uh, I don't find it to be as useful to me as are substances like psilocybin, mushrooms, ayahuasca, uh, peyote, mescaline, and so forth. But it's, again, it's a very individual thing. Could you talk about um, plant intelligence, interaction with plants and the intelligence of, of consciousness of plants? Well, the existence of yes. Um, I guess I'm not really an expert on that, but I'll I could say a few words about it. Uh, we hear a lot about plant spirits, and the, and these plants are conceived of in many traditional cultures as being teachers, plant teachers that uh, can teach. Personally, I think that plants are superior beings to animals, and in that they can make their own energy from the sun, they make their own carbohydrates from solar energy and minerals and water from the soil. Uh, we see them as being a type of an inferior life, but it's a different type of a life form and in many ways it's far superior, something that can set up and deploy, root itself in the ground and deploy its own solar collectors is pretty sophisticated. As far as the idea of plant consciousness and plant intelligence, I think everything that's alive has some form of consciousness or is intelligent. Life itself is intelligence. And uh, any, any organism is capable of reacting to its environment in very sophisticated ways. Uh, it's more a question of the speed at which this happens that really affects our perception, perhaps, of how intelligent it is. But as far as the question of whether the plants are actively teaching us or reaching out to us to convey information. Personally, I haven't perceived it that way. I don't have any basis for rejecting that or arguing against it. Uh, I don't particularly disbelieve it or or believe it. My, my inclination as a natural scientist is to think something along these lines, a more mechanistic, some would say reductionistic approach, that the fact that plants contain dimethyltryptamine, for example, which is also found in the human and other animal nervous systems, is not in and of itself surprising because it's a fairly simple compound that would be on the pathway from tryptophan, the amino acid, to any number of uh, biochemicals that are found in, in many plants and animals. Now, plants like us are trying to solve the same problems of survival in this ecosystem with the same building blocks and uh, nature has a law of, by the law of parsimony, some things are tried early on and work and they tend to become more or less universal through all uh, uh, co-evolved creatures. And so I think rather that it's more of a type of a coincidence that the plants contain dimethyltryptamine, uh, which is a neuro, some, appears to be a type of neurotransmitter in our nervous system and other animal nervous systems. And so when we take it, we get this extraordinary effect. Personally, I don't perceive it as the plant reaching out to me to teach me something. Definitely something is being taught, but uh, I think it's not uh, a communication from plant to human being in, this, in, in any kind of sense in which I understand the term of communication, but that's just my particular bias. I don't have any uh, reason to argue against that if people have the other bias. You're very broad-minded. <laughs> what are um, some of the dangers of experimenting, becoming acquainted with the entheogenic plant? Well, I can't deny that there's a specific reference to diet as part of that. I see. Uh, referring to ayahuasca, for example. Well, uh, there are definitely dangers involved in this. Uh, I have been criticized by some people for... I have a more or less libertarian philosophy, uh, political philosophy and economic ph philosophy, and I feel that it's best to put these substances in the hands of people who want access to them. And so I'm interested in spreading technology, both uh, the genetic packaging, the seeds, the strains of uh, plants that are suitable for this purpose, as well as technology for their, for their processing and use, so that people, as I said, can develop their own relationship with the plant.